Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this meeting of the Economic Policy Working Group. Uh, John Cochran and I are together welcoming you, and we're very happy that Marcus Brunermeyer has agreed to speak to us. Uh, Marcus is the Stan Stanford, I should not say Stanford professor, the Stanford professor at Princeton, and he's the director of the Princeton Benheim Center uh, for Finance. Uh, he's advised both the Fed and the Bundesbank, not bad. So, uh, and, and has written this beautiful book, The Resilient Society, which he will focus on for the next 30, 35 minutes. And uh, if you want to ask questions uh, anytime, but we'll, we reserve the latter part of the meeting to questions. So raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you and uh, anything is open. So Marcus, uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, why don't you get started? Thanks a lot, uh, John. It's a pleasure to be with you and thanks for all of you for coming. So for listening to this uh, book I wrote, it's, uh, it's written for the more general public. So it will be without any equations. We talked about this earlier on. Uh, so essentially the motivation of this book was I organized this webinar series where I invited many prominent speakers and I learned it and I wanted to bring it together under a common theme of resilience. And of course we will have currently we have the COVID crisis but we might have many other shocks coming down the road. We will probably have antibiotic resistance, probably another financial crisis, perhaps not too late, uh, cyber attacks, natural disasters, and we might have certain huge uncertainties with new technologies. And the question is how to deal with all the shocks. And I would argue resistance is not the way to deal with it. The, the, the way to deal with it is resilience. And I would like to say whoever uses the word resilience, what does it mean? What, how is it different from robustness? How is it different from avoiding risk? And you know, can you connect it to sustainability concepts as well? So it's more trying to understand what is the resilience concept and uh, what is it not and related to other concepts. And the first contrast I would like to make is contrast resilience with robustness. While robustness is essentially when you face a shock, you withstand the shock, you're fault tolerant, you block the shock. Resilience is all about you take the impact, but then you bounce back potentially to a new normal. So it's, it's about reacting to a shock. How can you react to a shock? And it goes back to, I draw an old story, an old from the 17th century by the French writer La Fontaine, who compares the oak and the reed. The oak is very rigid and stands in the winds and doesn't move much, while the reed is constantly floating back and forth and bouncing back. And if there's a very strong hurricane, then the oak is falling over and can't come back up. There's a tipping point or robustness barrier. And beyond that, the oak can't come back, but the reed is still bouncing back. And then the reed in the story, in this fable, the reed is talking to the oak and said, I bend, I bow, but I do not break. And it seems like the reed is way more volatile, way more risky. But at the end of the day, it's actually this rigid oak, which is so much more risky. And that's what I call this volatility paradox, where it's something which is volatile, and bounces back and forth all the time might not be so risky compared to something which is very rigid and seems very stable. And also in order to get robustness or resilience requires different forms of redundancies. All of these, we need buffers you know, against shocks, but if you want really a robust system, you need a lot of redundancies for each shock, while for resilience, you might need fewer redundancies, but you need more flexible redundancies which you can redeploy easily, whatever shock it is. So that's essentially another thing so you save on redundancies, but you need it to be able to be flexibly re-employable. So you might say is resilience all about flexibility and is robustness more about rules, you know, Taylor rule and other rules. And you know, coming from Germany, of course we're very rule driven. And I think it's uh, robustness is what is rigidity is what you want to avoid. But you also, if you have certain rules, it gives you flexibility because you create through commitment power, you can communicate a reaction function and that makes you a credible reaction function that makes you actually more resilient. So it's not necessarily purely flexibility. You also need certain rules and certain 
rules with certain reaction functions, which give you some flexibility. So that's the first contrast I would like to make between robustness and resilience. The other contrast I would like to make is just risk versus resilience or risk avoidance. So risk itself is a, is, a, is a static concept. It's all about the variance or the standard deviation, or if you have downside risk, value at risk. If you think about systemic risk, it's uh, COVAR and other systemic risk measures with spillovers from one to the next. Resilience is a dynamic concept, which is about mean reversion. You know, how quickly will you bounce back? What's the half-life of a shock until you come back? So it's, it's more the dynamic aspects to it. And let me spend a little bit of time uh, on that. So if you, for example, you have a resilient path here. So what I have is, you know, it, you have a crisis and, you know, it goes back and then it goes back down, it goes back up. And if you think about the, the Friedman blocking model, it was essentially like that. No, that's like the guitar string you bring down the recession, but then you come back and you come always back to the old uh, growth path, if you think of log GDP on the y-axis. But that's what's resilience. And that's, you know, from Lucas, we know we shouldn't worry about recessions much. What really matters is the expected growth rate if you always come back. So what I will argue, let's not focus so much on risk. Let's focus whether risk is resilient or is not resilient. And then we have to focus on what makes essentially risk non-resilient. So for example, if I contrast again, the risk and the risk less. So here's the dashed line, which is, has a low expected growth path, but it is risk less while I have this resilient path. In the long run, I'm much better off to go for the more risky, but resilient path. Also, what I don't want, and that comes back to this volatility paradox, I don't want to avoid crisis by kicking the can down the road. So often what we do is, we work very hard to avoid smaller crises, but actually then the risk is building up in the background and then it erupts in a bigger crisis. Just think about the housing bubble and other things. So you can have this dash line now is our old resilient path. I can actually avoid these downturns through policy measures and then I go, but I just push the can down the road and then it will be a much bigger crisis uh, later on. So that's essentially where sometimes being exposed to smaller crises, you might learn how to react to crisis and then you can manage some later crises much better. So that you know, relates also to the one example is this human immune system. Now, if you raised in total sterile environments, you don't know how to handle it. Uh, when you know some bacteria comes, but if you grow up in a less sterile environment, then actually you might be hit by smaller crises, smaller sicknesses early on, but you can handle them later on uh, some bacteria much more easily. So just avoiding crises at any cost is not the right way to go. Uh, exposing people or, you know, when you raise children, it's the same thing. You expose them to some risk because that's how they learn how to deal with risk and learn how to react and become more resilient. And that's you know, another lesson from that. But coming back, what are the risks we should avoid? It's not what's really, really risky. It's what the risks which are not resilient. And I call them three resilience destroyers. The one I call traps, feedbacks, and tipping points. And let me just go through them briefly at a conceptual level. So a trap is, of course, you know, when you have a trap, you have drawn a horizontal line, that's trap. Once you hit it, you're trapped, you can't go back up again. So if you now have the choice between the dashed line and the, the other old resilient line, but if you have a trap, you hit this trap, and then you're caught, you can't come back. So we want to avoid traps, poverty traps, middle income traps, liquidity traps. We have in the economic literature, we have millions of these traps. So look out for traps. The other things you want to avoid is tipping points. Tipping points are even worse than traps because once you hit a tipping point, then feedback loops kick in and then you spiral, the whole thing spirals out of control. So you have some bifurcation on this tipping point. But once we hit the tipping point, the whole situation is getting much worse. And that's essentially what you want to look out for. Now we'll come back to this feedback loops uh, in a minute when I, I you know, go much more in detail into that. But before I do this, 
the interaction between resilience and tipping points is not so trivial. It's not like saying, okay, whenever there are some tipping points, avoid the risk. But whenever there is no tipping point, uh, then you can go for the resilient uh, risky thing. Now, here's an example. We're actually going for the resilient but more risky path is the way to go. Okay, so here's our tipping point, but now the expected growth rates are much lower. So if you go for the resilient path, you have a slightly positive expected growth rate. If you go for the riskless path, now it's actually negative growth rate. In such a case, actually going for the resilient growth path allows you to escape a tipping point. Okay, so it's not, as I said earlier, uh, whenever the tipping point does not automatically imply avoid uh, the risky part, it could be that a resilient risky part actually allows you to escape the tipping point while the risk-free part would actually hit you to the tipping point. The book describes, you know, what you do in order to get the resilient strategy. You have to take on some risk. So it's very much, you know, avoiding risk is, is not the way to go. You have to have a plan B. And you, of course, you have to have a strategy to contain the crisis and there's different measures uh, to contain crisis, but you also have a parallel strategy to bounce back to the new normal. It doesn't need to be the old one. So in terms of COVID, it means, you know, you do all the containment measures and all this, but you also develop in parallel some vaccine which helps you to bounce back. So, so avoiding risk and going not for R&D and other things is not the way uh, to go. The challenge, of course, is often when you to communicate to society how you approach this, because it's very hard to communicate the counterfactuals. So the population is very hard to communicate counterfactuals. So, but in summary, I think resilience is different from robustness, and resilience is different from avoiding risk. And what you really want to do, you go into risk as long as resilience is maintained, it's fine to go into uh, some risky environment. And so you want to avoid tipping points, feedback loops, and, uh, and, um, uh, and traps. I can also relate the resilience to, sustain to the concept of sustainability. Sustainability is broader than resilience. Uh, sustainability, if something is not resilient, it's not sustainable. Okay? But resilience alone is not enough to have make something sustainable. You also need, you need resilience and you need no adverse trend. So for example, in this example, this path is resilient, but there's an adverse trend, so it's not sustainable. So if you have resilience and no adverse trend, then, um, uh, then you have sustainability. You need both of that. Uh, let me jump over that. So there's also a term structure of resilience. So in terms of, you can be very forceful, go deeply into debt, let's say, in order to bounce quickly back from the current shock, but it makes you more vulnerable to future shocks, less resilience in the future. So there's a trade-off, some dynamic trade-offs to consider uh, how much you want to act today in order to become more resilient, but this makes you vulnerable to future shocks. In particular, you know, if in the fiscal expenditures, you might say, oh, this is really, uh, we have to be resilient, we act a lot, but it makes you, then you have no reserves and no buffers for the next shock. And that's essentially uh, one problem. But the book is about this resilience of society and the resilience can be at different levels. It can be at the individual level, at the system level and the societal level. So individual level, there's a lot of books written in psychology and other fields on personal well beings and mental health, how you bounce back. The book is not about that. The book is about more society and the systems. And systems, you know, networks, the electric grid or the interbank market can be more or less resilient or global value change can be more or less resilient. And there's systemic risk due to spillovers, domino effects and all that. But what makes resilience of society is very interesting is it's about people and the interaction of people. And what I want to do is I want to really highlight what's really dangerous is externalities combined with strategic complementarities. Okay, so externalities themselves are bad enough, so they lead to inefficiencies. But when you combine them with negative, uh, with 
uh, strategic complementarities, but then they're dangerous. And that's what I call these feedback externalities. And it's just a name, from, if you have a situation where both combines, and then I go to the social contract, how to contain these feedback externalities. So here's just a simple example. There are two people or two institutions. The first institution acts, they cause a negative externality, and then the person B experiences this negative externality and suffers from that and then reacts to it. Because of strategic complementarities, it does the same thing, and that causes then uh, some spill back to person A, which then, because of strategic complementarities, does even more of this initial action, which causes even more externalities. So you get in this feedback loop when the spirals, when, you, when the feedback through, through strategic complementarities are combined with negative externalities. And that's what I call these feedback externalities, which are really dangerous. And the social contract, which, whose aim should be, or which aim should be to contain externality, should really watch out for these feedback externalities. Of course, there are trivial examples like hoarding and buying toilet paper. You know, I buy more toilet paper, cause a negative externality on you, but your reaction is to buy also toilet paper, and, and then I have, I have less toilet paper and so forth, and it spirals out of control. And there are a lot of social arrangements which might be subject to these feedback externalities. And that's where we have, you know, have to change our law, or we have to change our social contract more generally uh, to avoid these feedback externalities. Uh, from an abstract perspective. And that, they destroy these feedbacks, they destroy essentially resilience uh, of the society. So the book goes a little bit into social contracts, political science, um, but it, it does it very much from an economist's perspective. So it's very much, you know, Thomas Hobbes or John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, it's more Thomas Hobbes interpretation, but very much from an ex externality interpretation. And what the social contract should do, and I want to argue that the social contract itself should be resilient, uh, but the social contract has to limit externalities, in particular the feedback externalities, so externalities from others. And it also has to limit shocks, which I call externalities from mother nature. If you think about shocks, they are also externalities that just come from mother nature. And you would like to set up a social contract or the, the way we live together in a way that you know you take in ex ante investments to make people individually more resilient. That's one way to do it. Or exposed, you intervene by providing some resilience exposed. So if people, some people in the society face a negative shock, they can actually bounce back more easily. And this is different from pure insurance. It's about you know helping people to come back to society rather than just dumping money on, on them. So it's a little bit like, rather than giving just unemployment insurance, you give them reskilling so they find their way back to the labor force. And this way they get their dignity back, they're part of society again. So this resilience is this bouncing back. And of course, from an ex-ante perspective, it occurs under the wheel of ignorance, like John Rawls. And, and there's a trade-off between how you want to design society. And the trade-off is the following. If you have a more heterogeneous society, more diversity, uh, shocks are more idiosyncratic than systematic. So the same shock affects us differently. Some of us benefit, others are losing. So we are more, we, it's easier for us to uh, provide insurance to each other or some resilient support to each other. So the more diverse we are as a society, the better it is to ensure each other or provide resilient support to each other. The other thing is, of course, we know from uh, Alberto Alessina's work, the more homogeneous we are, the more willing we are to ensure each other. Because there's a tension, so the more diverse we are, the easier it is, the, because more shocks, so it is graphic shocks, not systematic shocks. Uh, but on the other hand, the less willing we are to really insure each other. So Scandinavian countries are much more willing to have more social insurance and all these programs because they're more homogeneous. And that's where the tension is in terms of setting up a society. But in general, so how do you implement the social contract? And I argue uh, three aspects are very important. Of course, governments and markets. You know, if you want more innovation, it's, it's on the market side. 
uh, but also what's really important are social norms. And in economics, you often underemphasize the social norms. And each country, each society has to find its way, you know, the optimal dot, how much weight you want to put. But what I depict, if you look in Japan, for example, social norms play a huge role. So here I've just contrasted Germany with Japan. If you look at this COVID stringency index, so how much political or how many measures were undertaken by the government to really limit the spreading of COVID, in Germany was way more dramatic uh, than in Japan. Uh, because uh, the social norms themselves reinforce themselves. I didn't compare Korea because they use a lot of technology. Japan did not use a lot of technology. It's just the social norms were set up this way that everybody was wearing face masks anyway and was very cautious. And if you didn't wear your face mask, your neighbor was watching over you. So you didn't need any government enforcement for that. And, and you see in terms of the cases, the cases were also much lower in Japan. Uh, despite a much lower stringency index. So I just think this social norms aspects plays an important role. But what's really important is that, uh, you know, if, if you have a social contract which can modify this, so what happens, the problem with social norms is you cannot really, they're very rigid. So they don't adjust. Social norms don't immediately adjust if there's a new environment because of COVID. While you know government measures or markets can be much more flexible and can adjust more quickly, so it just worked out this the particular social norms Japan had worked pretty well uh, for them. And a good social contract actually also the dot adjusts with uh, the environment. And importantly, if you go back, if the environment changes back to the region, actually the government also withdraws them. It's not that. Um, I was told the speed limit was introduced in the 70s in the US because of the high oil prices. And then when the oil prices came back down, the speed limit was never removed. So, but there are many government measures which probably will never be removed uh, later on. Now let me, so the book covers a lot of aspects in economics. Let me just highlight a few, just to give you a, a little teaser or a little taste, uh, which area it goes into, and then perhaps I go uh, a little bit into fiscal debt uh, discussion with the book covers as well. So the, the first part of the book is, is mostly about health. It's about how do you design uh, uh, vaccines to return to the new normal? How many vaccines to develop in parallel uh, to have some benefits from diversification, but also if something goes wrong, so what's it, the optimal design to distribute vaccines? So it goes in particular health considerations and how to develop these two parallel strategies to contain the crisis and also to bounce back. Then there's, there's other chapters which are focusing more on the macro aspects, which uh, you know, is saying, arguing, emphasizing the low real interest rates, which gives you more fiscal space. So there's more room for resilience on the fiscal space, but it gives you when the nominal interest rate is lower, less monetary space, because you can't cut the interest rates much below the zero dollar bound. So that discusses that. And I will go to this a little bit further. If you want to create resilience in the finance arena, what's really important is uh, that you have efficient debt restructuring. If you don't have this, you have debt overhang problems, zombification, things like that. So efficient debt restructuring is very important. And of course in the US, there's no stigma attached for going bankrupt and or very little stigma attached to that. It's much more easy in the US compared to other countries. Of course, capital requirements and buffers is another way to go, but I would argue debt restructuring uh, is, is one important thing. And let me come back to my oak and my, my reed. And once you think about debt and equity, uh, you can think of you know, the oak and the reed shining through as well. So, if I have here on the x-axis, I have the cash flow of the government, let's say tax revenue, or I have uh, the realization of cash flows of the company. And a debt contract is, is just a flat line here, it pays off. And it's a little bit like the oak, it doesn't seem risky at all, because it's only risky when you go bankrupt and then there's some bankruptcy costs. And that's essentially then uh, in the case of bankruptcy, then there's uh, losses there, but it's very, uh, stable in normal circumstances, and that's like, like the oak. While in contrast, the, the, the equity is constantly volatile, like the reed is constantly bouncing back, but ultimately 
the, the read is more stable as a system. The whole system based on equity is way more stable and also because it's not so run prone compared to the, the debt, in particular short-term debt. So that's essentially where this resilience comes from. It's a little bit like uh, the read. Equity financing seems much more volatile, but as a system, uh, it actually stands back up much more easily compared to a system which is very much on debt financing, based on debt financing. You know, there are many other aspects. So let me just, for example, mention some of that. Uh, I developed this concept of resilience inequality. So we have, of course, we talk in economics, we talk about income inequality, wealth inequality. We talk about social mobility, which is a dynamic concept. The others are just snapshots. And I would argue that resilience inequality is equally important. And let me tell you what it is. You can probably imagine. Imagine two people, they have the same wealth, they have the same income, but one, if he faces a shock, he can bounce back, and person B cannot bounce back. And that's, you know, I think it's very important that you are able to bounce back if you take on some risks. And if you look at this person A and person B, the person A can bounce back and person B cannot bounce back. Person A has now the opportunity to take on some projects. Person B is scared to take on. And, you know, that will lead to higher income and expectations because it gets a risk premium from that. And that leads to higher wealth for person A. And person B can never get out of it because he doesn't have the same resilience. And I think that's why, you know, having the ability to bounce back prevents somebody from taking opportunities which might benefit himself, but all society if people undertake opportunities. And I think this resilience inequality is another way to capture inequality. He has a whole chapter on emerging economies, uh, you know, starting out with poverty traps, middle income traps. I mean, poverty traps, as I said, is one of the resilience killers. Uh, middle income trap, if a country catches up, but it can never get to the frontier because it just is in the copying phase. So it talks about the middle income trap and what, uh, what are the causes for that. It has a chapter on international macrofinance. What's the role of flexible exchange rates? Uh, you know, how it helps you to bounce back after a crisis because you devalue your currency as long as your debt is not uh, sufficiently denominated in dollar debt or in, uh, in foreign denominated debt. It talks about the global role of uh, the US dollar as a safe asset, um, what role it plays in destabilizing resilience, making this global economy more or less resilient. And then there's uh, one part dedicated to international trade, global value chains, where you know we went very much from, we came from a just-in-time emphasis to a just-in-case. Uh, I propose a stress test for global value change. So we do a lot of stress tests for financial institutions. We might want to stress test also um, global value change, or at least ask companies to do it on their own if they're not doing it already. On them for themselves. And there's a lot of talk about global geopolitics. And there's a final chapter on, on climate change where I outline the sustainability uh, concept and I also outline uh, very much um, you know, how we try to deal with that. So we try to deal this through uh, equity prices, which means, if it's, so if I just spend one minute on that, Typically, you would like to deal with these problems with Peruvian taxes or pollution permits, and you would like to phase them in over time to minimize the risk associated with these policies. And most of this risk is associated with policy risk. So you want to minimize this risk. So ex ante, you would like to fix it. Ex post, you would like to stay flexible. But if you want to have too much flexibility, you have to pay a risk premium from that. And some people don't mind having high risk premium on that but the high risk premium makes the holding much more costly. And the risk premium itself is like a Peruvian tax with one big difference, a Peruvian tax, I get some revenue. If I have a, a Peruvian risk premium, it's just a welfare loss. Okay, it still is directing the whole investment towards climate investments, but it's a welfare loss. I don't get the tax revenue. Now let me spend a few more minutes um, or perhaps on, on, on the on debt situation uh, and uh, outline my views on that. So there are different aspects. I just jump into one chapter a little bit uh, 
if you don't mind. Of course, what we have, as I mentioned before, uh, in order to have resilience prior to a shock, you would like to have a low fiscal debt level. And this gives you then during the shock, the countercyclical response. And that means we have to bring the debt level down again in order to have that. And we have to be aware right now, we have this high public debt, but the low real interest rate. So it's a huge benefit from having this low real interest rate, but the interest rate might spike again especially when you lose the safe asset status. So the US has this big benefit that it has the safe asset status. And I will explain in a minute what I mean by this as safe asset status. The US has it, Germany has it, Japan has it, and so forth. In Europe, all the other countries would like to share it with Germany to get the safe asset status as well. But the, the big thing is the interest rates might spike. So rather than looking at the debt to GDP ratio, we might want to look at debt servicing costs. So often people say we should look at debt servicing cost because the interest rate is low, we can have a much higher debt level this time. But I would argue we should actually look at the value at risk of the debt servicing cost, not just at the current debt servicing cost, but how much it might spike. And that's essentially what we have to look at. And so the low interest rate gives us more fiscal policy space, but we should be aware uh, of these aspects. And of course, here's just a figure you're all familiar with. Uh, that's just the CPO projections of the debt level and fraction of GDP for the United States. And you know that's where we are right now, and that's where we're going. And, uh, and this is uh, the debt servicing cost is, is this line. So you might say, okay, look at the 80s, how huge the debt servicing costs were. So we're still not so far off of, because the interest rate is so low, but you know, then the interest rate debt servicing costs will go up too. So it's much less dramatic for the debt servicing costs that they're going up, but we have to be aware that they might spike uh, in this regard. Now, as I said, I think we should focus much more on the, the the debt servicing cost, but the value at risk of the debt servicing cost in addition to the debt to GDP ratio. That raises the issue, why is actually the government debt interest rate so low in, in, in many countries or in particular in the advanced economies? And Brazilians wouldn't argue that. Uh, and I would argue that, you know, we need uh, enlarged asset pricing formula by having not only the present value of cash flows, but also the present value of service flows. And I will go into that a little bit. Uh, so what are the, the cash flows? That's our standard asset pricing formula, but we have also service flows. What are the service flows? And some of the service flows are just mundane convenience yield things, some interest rate advantage because you relax your cash and advance constraint or it relaxes some collateral constraint and like Roche multiplier is showing up. But I would argue that the safe asset thing is different. The safe asset is way bigger and it is a conceptually a different thing and it results from retrading. So it's a safe asset status is something if I hold something for safety, I know I can easily retrade when I need it. Uh, and the safe asset is like a good friend. It's around when you need it. And that's uh, what I would like to illustrate uh, uh, for a minute. So the best way to illustrate it, why, you are, why we need this service flow from the safe asset thing. Why is this special? I have a simple example and that will probably remind John from his famous FTPL equation. So the real value of government bonds. So the nominal value divided by the price level is just the expected present value of the primary surpluses. I put on the service flow on top of it. Um, and I make it simple. Let's suppose, you know, there's the primary surplus always zero in this example. And I have two people, Alan and Beth, they, are, they hold the safe asset, which pays zero cash flow or zero primary surpluses. And then they have other assets, which pay some positive cash flows. Okay. And then when, and the big assumption I make is that they have idiosyncratic risk. They have certain risk they cannot share because markets are imperfect. Think of an Iagari type model. Think of many type of these incumbent markets, modern Bewley and so forth. Now, if the world goes up, Alan's cash flow expand and Beth cash flows contract. If the world goes down, it goes exactly the opposite direction. So I make it very stark here. There are only two guys and they are perfectly negatively correlated 
um, assets. And then the world keeps on going and so forth. Now, what happens is if this single cash flow asset has some value, then it will be the case that Alan will buy some of the safe asset from Beth at some price in exchange to this cash flow asset. And if the world goes down, they, be, they just swap exactly the other way around. So even to Alan Beth, for market imperfections reasons, they cannot insure each other directly through contracting or trading something. They can do this by holding this seemingly worthless asset and then retrading depending how the state of the world plays out. And this way they can insure each other partially, not fully, they cannot fully do it, but they hold for precautionary reasons, they hold this zero cash flow asset and purely that it helps them to partially insure each other later on. And that creates value. That has some service flow, even though there's no cash flow, no primary surplus, it has the service flow. And that's why they value this asset for precautionary reasons and keep on holding this. And what's very important is, it is important that this asset can be easily retraded, like the US Treasury, low bid ask spread. And if in March 2020 bid ask spread widens, you lose a safe asset status. That's why the Fed moved in as a market maker of last resort. And that's what the service flow is. Of course, I was you know, hiding a little bit I discount here at the, at the R double star. Let me tell you what this R double star is in order to get this formula. So the R double star is essentially, uh, typically if I have a standard model um, where let's suppose the log utility, what is my risk-free rate? The risk-free rate is just my time preference rate rho. Sorry, there is an equation now. And plus expected growth rate. So typically of gamma times a, that's my Ramsey term, minus my precautionary terms, which is, you know, this is always half gamma brackets gamma plus one. But let's say we have log utility with gamma equals one. That's the aggregate consumption risk plus the idiosyncratic consumption risk. And the idiosyncratic consumption risk depresses my risk free rate, it pushes the risk free rate down. And it might push it down below, below the growth rate of the economy on top of it. Okay? And then there's a risk premium on this. And then there might be some convenience yield on this government bond as well. Okay? But let's ignore all of that. What I take out, I take this idiosyncratic risk out. I move it over to the convenience yield stuff. And then I call this thing my discount rate or double star. Okay? So that's essentially, I just take a repressive agent view perspective where there's no idiosyncratic risk, it can be washed out and say, that's my discount rate. And if I, if I have this idiosyncratic risk, it depresses the risk free rate and that's the term which depresses the risk free rate and it might depress it below G. And this is the case, not only for the government bond, if Apple is issuing a corporate bond, it is also issuing at this uh, low risk free rate. So it doesn't show up in in the, as a convenience yield measure, the traditional convenience yield measure. But what's the difference is, who can actually write such a Ponzi scheme? That essentially depends on the equilibrium you're in, and a more reasonable equilibrium we would argue, and the government would fight for this equilibrium, is that this equilibrium, which the government can actually run the Ponzi scheme, that's the equilibrium which will be picked ultimately. Okay, and that's where your safe asset status comes from. You can, as a government, run a Ponzi scheme uh, and this way you can uh, have a high valuation of government debt. All this debt valuation puzzle papers, what Hanna Lustig and all your colleagues uh, have written about, I think you can resolve that. Now, there comes another aspect. Why is it the case that the value of the government bonds rise in times of crisis? Going back to my Allen and Bath example, I'm making another assumption that's very reasonable, I would say, that in times of crisis, idiosyncratic risk is moving up. So there's more idiosyncratic risk in times of crisis. So the service flow that being able to partially complete the markets in my incubate market setting through retrading becomes more valuable. So this expected present value of the service flow is actually going up. So at times of crisis, the government bond increases in value because the service flow becomes larger. And that gives you a negative beta on your government bond, okay? So if you don't have that, you always get a positive beta because the cash flows in the real world 
government issues that in times of crisis and pays back in times of booms, but the service flow goes exactly in the opposite direction. That drives the whole thing. That drives you the negative beta. And that makes you know, government bonds a safe asset, very valuable. That's a nice privileged position to be in. Um, essentially that's, um, which allows certain governments, not the Brazilian government, but that allows you know, the US, German, Japanese government and so forth to enjoy this particular status. So that, that's in a sense what I think a safe asset is. It's a good friend. You can actually, when you face your washing machine breaks down, your car breaks down, you can sell it. And it is a risk. So it's a good friend for it is a risk whenever you face a shock. But it's also a good friend for aggregate risk because our aggregate risk is characterized and heightened it is a risk. And that's when, the, when we go in a recession, it is a risk goes up and output goes down. But that's also, when the safe asset appreciates in the value, because now suddenly we think it is a great risk insurance through this retrading is much more important. So it's also a good friend in terms of aggregate risk. So I got a little bit sidelined um, on this, but let me just give you the, the overview of the book again. So the first part of the book is all about defining resilience and other concepts like robustness, risk avoidance, sustainability, and so forth, and connecting it with the society. I talked about this feedback externalities and how to limit the feedback externalities. The second part is about four elements, how to manage resilience, and particularly in the COVID crisis. I didn't go much into that, I didn't have time. And then the third part is on macro aspects. Um, I argue in the book that the COVID has a lot of innovation boosting effects because you know it breaks a lot of regulation. Telemedicine you know, helped a lot. Uh, but it holds all those scarring effects and we have to balance it too. I talked about, I talk about the financial, what I call financial whipsaw, 2020 March collapsed and then it bounced back. And I talked already last week, uh, last year about the inflation whipsaw. Uh, very, I mean, when the book was written much earlier that inflation was going down because of demand pressure and then it bounced back now, it's obvious. Um, and about public debt and so forth. And then the final part of the book talks about emerging market and developing economies, all the geopolitics, the, where Europe should find its place in US and China, things like that, value chains and global finance. And I see many hands raised and I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Marcus, it's, it's terrific. And you're right, lots of people have their hands raised. I wonder if, uh, I know Axel Mark had a comment, maybe not a hand. Do you want to start, Maxel, and then we'll go to Niels? Yes, this is Axel. I'm Marcus. Thanks so much for the presentation. You somewhat answered my, my question. What I would really love you to hear is, can you phrase your framework on the subtle risk out there? You, you mostly focus on the big shocks out there. And with subtle risk, I mean competitive environments, right? You, you talk about the, the low yields. Well, it appears that for whatever reason, German society in particular, um, well, they're re resilient versus shocks, but they don't seem to be able to keep up on the innovative side. And so you address that somewhat with tipping points, all kinds of things, but I'd love you to just phrase it from your point of view, how, how you look at that in, in the context of your book. Yeah, so I haven't looked so much into subtle risks. That's a very nice angle. I have to think more about it, but I would say, you know, Germany is very much like the oak and you know, the Germans are very, proud of their oaks. In a sense, I was some people uh, attacked me saying, okay, you're giving up the German oak. But in Germany, the flexibility is not there and going for innovation and going for uh, risky strategies even, you know, which helps you to bounce back. And then that's, that's one big uh, challenge I think Germany in particular faces. That's of course much less of an issue for the United States uh, where there's way more risk taking and way more bouncing back and adjusting and modifying. And that's the way I, I would see it, but I haven't, uh, so it could be some trial and error. So to constantly have some trial and try, and if you fail, you don't, you're not attached with a bad stigma, you can come back. I think that's very important for society to flourish. And um, I think there are certain countries which need more to shift and there's in other countries less so. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Niels? Yeah, I raised my hand when, when you started discussing the social contract thing. Um, 
It seems to me that uh, your resilient society is quite similar to Karl Popper's open society or even Hayek's great society, you know, with experiential learning, the role of law, uh, experimentation and so on and so forth. What would be a comment about that? Yeah, indeed, it's it's very similar in, in this regard. And, you know, I, I think what's very important is this diversity and also allowing for mavericks, allowing for people who think differently, uh, that gives you resilience. Uh, that helps you to bounce back after a shock. If you have a very homogeneous society, uh, it might help you to find some policy measures more easily, but it might not help you to find new innovative ways to get back yeah. onto your feet. And I think that's, in this sense, I think an open society, experimental way of things, that's very much what, what we're trying to express. Open public discussions and so on and so forth, yeah. Uh, Steve Davis. Hey, Marcus, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, comment on what seemed to me to be missing aspects of resilience and sources of resilience, at least in your talk. So let's go back to your discussion of social insurance programs and. Um, you made the point that um, there's more scope for social insurance in more diverse societies, but we know from the work of Alicina that there seems, and others, there seems to be less willingness to supply it. And first, first remark about that is it's not just about willingness, it might also be about capacity and ability to supply it effectively. So it may be that it's easier to sustain social norms that discourage exploitation of um, social insurance programs and homogeneous society and so on. So there's an aspect of capacity. Uh, and I wanted to use that as a springboard to what I think is a bigger point, which is diverse societies in some circumstances may have trouble, more trouble marshalling the type of cohesiveness that is needed to respond to certain common shocks. So to put this in a concrete way, you can think about um, societies that uh, are insufficiently cohesive, find it difficult to mount a defense against, say, national security threats. Now, that, that puts a very different spin on the connection between um, diversity and homogeneity, the trade-off there. There are some diverse societies like the United States that manage to supply a common defense against national security threats, maintain that type of cohesion, despite their heterogeneity, but there are many examples of societies that achieve cohesiveness or where their leaders try to achieve cohesiveness precisely through homogeneity and cultivating a sense of common nation and so on. So I didn't see this notion of capacity for cohesive response to certain common threats and its connection to diversity showing up anywhere in your discussion. It's a very good point. Uh, I very much agree with that. I mentioned it not explicitly as, as you did. So I have a paragraph, I mean, I have something written in the book on how important it is to have a common identity. And as a nation, you form a common identity. And I explain, you know, how, for example, Nelson Mandela was using uh, the Rugby World Cup to really bring off the apartment came down bring the country together. And that's this cohesiveness, which is really important, or this common identity, that you can act in a particular way to react uh, in a particular way when the, when the shock comes. So because flexibility is one thing, but you have to be, have the power, as you said, the capacity to react to the shock. And social cohesion helps us. And for this, common identity helps. And the certain leaders who understand to build this common identity and uh, you know, it shouldn't be nationalism. So I'm coming from Germany, so I'm being very, very, very well aware of that. But bringing things right. together, and using some sports events and, and other things um, to build that. Uh, nevertheless, I think you can come with different backgrounds and then have some common uh, forces which bring you together. But I agree with you, the capacity is, is a crucial element. I probably, when I write my next edition, I will expand on that dimension more. Uh, John Cochran, John. Thank you so much, Marcus. This was really, really interesting. I'm glad that economists are allowed to think big thoughts too. Uh, I just, I, I accumulated a, a number of small comments, but they're not all, all related. Uh, first, um, 
it seems that there's a third element you're, you're missing. You, you, trans, you talked about avoiding risk versus uh, resilience of recovering, but there's a step of, of where what you do is you mitigate losses given the shock, not just plan to recover from the shock afterwards. And many of your examples actually seem to fall not into um, jump back from the shock, but keep the shock from getting too bad. Supply chains, uh, keeping some extra stuff around is, is about if the shock comes in, it won't be so bad as opposed to, well, the shock hit, but let's recover quickly from it. Uh, equity is similar. We're not changing the cash flow shock. We're just making the system not fall apart so much given the shock. Second uh, comment, um, I thought you were gonna go in a different direction, um, especially when we look at macroeconomics. The US seems to be slow to recover and slow to reform. We have recessions like the 2009 recession was just a step down and we didn't bounce back like we used to. We're slow to, to reform our institutions. We're slow to learn, just watch COVID where learning seems to be negative. You mentioned, you know, well, maybe we should reskill from top down, but you know, maybe the answer is we need more competition, entry, mobility, less red tape. We're, we're the Republic of paperwork now. Insurance, which you mentioned, is in, in, in public insurance is supporting the, uh, the rents of the status quo rather than encouraging the kind of dynamism that helps you to come back again. So I think if you're gonna be a resilient society, the resilient, somewhat more brutally competitive society comes back quicker. And we are now a society that, that doesn't. Finance, um, you said debt restructuring was great, but let's not forget about incentives while we're being resilient. Debt restructuring can be too efficient and then people take on way too much debt. Uh, and, and you didn't mention the other unresilient step, which I hope is in the book, uh, that um, our current system is immense amounts of debt. Thank you for the peon to equity, but we have immense amounts of debt. And then, then we think that the regulators are going to see all the problems coming and stop it from happening. Uh, that's an incredibly unresilient system. And the big comment, which this is the last comment, yes. <laughs> Um, the talk involves a lot of very highly nonlinear systems that are understood by their controllers. That's true in some engineering and biological con uh, con You said externalities combined with strategic complementarities. Boy, oh boy, where do the people at the Fed actually understand the nonlinear nature of externalities, strategic complementarities and spirals and loops? and where are they just blowing hot steam because they don't know what the heck's going on. Cer certainly a lot of that for the, some of the examples seems to exceed the technocratic capacity to understand nonlinear mechanisms when we don't even know the first derivatives. The best example is health. health the, the COVID is a very nonlinear system, exponential growth and evolution. And our, our policy makers are just completely incapable of making the basic adjustments you make when you're facing such a highly nonlinear system. Okay, so I try to address uh, all the points to some extent at least. So I agree with you, you know, bouncing back and mitigating uh, things is a little bit of a time scale. You, know, it, you, know, you can say, uh, I have a shock and then I come back. If, if I come back within a quarter and I look only at quarterly data, then mitigating and bouncing back within a quarter is the same thing. So if I can mitigate it and, and reduce the amplification of the shock, that's another thing. But what I had in mind in a bigger picture, what's your emphasis? Is your emphasis you build redundancies and buffers to mitigate things, or is your emphasis to bounce back? And then you need different redundancies. So you need fewer redundancies if you want to bounce back, and you, have, you need flexible redundancies you can redeploy, depending on the shock. So, if you mitigate, you need for, for potentially a different buffer, a different redundancy for each type of shock in order to really prevent from the whole thing for amplifying. I might go for fewer redundancies, but very flexible redundancies, but it might take a time to readjust whatever the machine is. That's or whatever. a really good point that if you're going to mitigate, you have to name all the thousand shocks, whereas yes, for each shock, I need every own shock. Buffer. Yes. And for for I have one mega machine, it doesn't fit well, but it takes me three weeks to adjust, whatever. And then I can bounce back and it, it is much more, and I can cover actually more shocks, but I'm sacrificing that I will be hit much more, but I can bounce back. And I think that's, that's what the main message I wanted to get across. I, I agree with you 
the, the, the slow to recover could be because of bureaucratism. That's the, the dynamism comes from the market. The who invented the, the vaccine? Or it came, of course, the government gave us through a lot of money in it, but it came from the private sector. No? It was, you know, Moderna and BioNTech and Pfizer essentially bringing it to light. So you have to combine that and individual. So if, I mean, I admire the CEO of BioNTech, you know, in January, he reoriented his whole company. You know, he was working on, on, on cancer treatment and he changed the whole company within a few weeks towards solving COVID. This was in January. It was not even clear that it would break out in the West the same way it was breaking out. So there's, there's some dynamism in the private space you will not see in, in the public space. So uh, uh, Marcus, we should, we should probably go to the next one and finish that off and go to Sebastian. Okay, let me just say, Debt sure. restructuring uh, it probably cannot be too efficient because if debt is too easily restructured, then it becomes just a risk sharing instrument. And finally, I'm very much I agree there's a highly nonlinear systems, but I'm more on high X perspective. We don't understand it. You know, we cannot macro engineer everything, but we have to be humble in when applying models or whatever, but because but we try at least. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you so Sebastian. Much. Go ahead, Sebastian. Uh, uh, th uh, thank you, John. Uh, thanks, Marcus. That was uh, fascinating. Um, I'm particularly interested, and I have a comment or maybe a suggestion on the social contract side, and it's uh, in some ways related to what uh, Steve Davis said. Um, I think that this notion of building and constructing a resilient society is very much related to the type of constitution countries want to have. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm uh, focusing on constitutions now, of course, is that my original country, Chile, now is in the midst of uh, ditching the Chicago Boys Constitution and adopting one that is uh, uh, to the left of uh, the social democratic constitutions. But the one, con I mean, it's, it's, it's a social rights constitution, the new one, uh, it's going to have, uh, uh, it's going to allow for state-owned enterprises and all sorts of things. But the one topic that I think they have not really, um, although it's, there are lots of constitutional scholars involved, they have not looked at is this resilience uh, um, angle. And I wonder, A, whether you, have touched on it in the book, and B, since you mentioned uh, next edition, if you don't, maybe you should. Yeah, so I have, I mean, I talked more about the social contract because the constitution is part of the social contract, just one, you know, officially written down part of it. Uh, in this sense, it is captured, but I didn't go into Chile, let's put it this way. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's really important, the resilience, and it seems, you know, uh, yeah, more to in God, but I, I agree with you. The so let, me, let me just add it very, very briefly. I know that we're running out of time. The one thing that they are discussing is whether the central bank should remain being um, independent, right? And the left is completely against it. Um, and we may end up with semi independence. And so that is, I think uh, uh, it's, it's a very specific issue that fits very well within your framework. And which yeah. turns out to be very important in the US and in other parts of the world, we take central bank independence for a given. But you mentioned yeah. Brazil and Argentina, and, and those are countries where it's a mess. Why? In part because it's not independent. I totally agree. I mean, that's, you know what, you need clear rules, you need independence. Uh, that's why I said initially the reaction functions, you know, you have to credibly communicate for this, you need some independence. Okay, uh, Jonathan Burke, please, Jonathan. Hey, Marcus. Uh, nice to see you again. And um, I have to say, Marcus, I'm very, very interested. This is this is really big thoughts, and it's nice to see people do that. It's, you're an impressive person. I have a very specific question. When you were talking about the interest rate on bonds and idiosyncratic risk, and in recessions, uh, idiosyncratic risk changed, I was confused because I wasn't clear what, 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 what exactly what you said. Did you say idiosyncratic risk increases in recessions or decreases? I think what you were saying is that idiosyncratic risk increases in recessions, yes. which is not what the data shows. But is that what you... Well, it's not on the bond. Not, what do you say? It's not on the bond. It's, it's the, the idiosyncratic risk. flexibility. Is that the issue we're talking about? 
No, it's so it is credit risk is increasing on you run a restaurant, you run a shop, a shop or anything on all physical investments. It is credit risk is increasing on the bond. It's not. No, no, but if you look at the market, for example, during times of crisis, it is in credit risk actually shrinks. Yes, because you see this huge aggregate risk. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. here, what I have in mind, this is uninsurably disengraded risk. So it's not something which is traded. Yeah. So, this what is, I, this is so I think what you have in mind is the following, which I agree with, which is that because people have different flexibilities, when the shock hits, some people are able to uh, bend better than others, shall we say. That's correct. Yes. Right. And that creates more idiosyncratic risk. Now, I mean, you're just saying that, right? You don't actually have evidence that supports this, do you? No. I mean, there's a lot of work done in that space. So people argue even that, you know, the regulatory risk is one of the biggest idiosyncratic risks we are facing. And that goes up. Or work by Nick Bloom and others, you know, have shown that idiosyncratic risk goes up in times of crisis or in times of downturns. But it's more on the firm level side, it's on the physical investments, not necessarily on the traded risk. Okay, I mean, I, I do think that, sh that, that finding empirical evidence of that could be quite important because I think you're onto something here. And if you should, you, you know, know, if we- Steve Davis, well, you know- yeah, there's, you there's, know lots of, there's lots of, of evidence that the dispersion of firm level outcomes, worker level outcomes rises during recessions. That, that's very well established. I mean, just think of unemployment risk. That's kind of an extreme version of an individual level shock, and that rises a lot during recessions. So I mean, yeah. Steve and Nick and David Altec, they even have an index in the Atlanta Fed. You can uh, look at it, how it rises and goes up and down. Oh, no. Thank you, John. Thank you, Marcus. I, well, my question is related to the latest discussion that we were having. So you talk, Marcus, about the nexus between resilience and uh, in the face of risk and what is social, how the two, the nexus between the two should inform a social contract. I was curious about your thoughts behind the building blocks of all of this. Uh, how, how should we be thinking about the different impact of risk versus uncertainty? And a social contract to an economist brings uh, societal preferences into mind. Different risk, different level of uncertainty, and different roles in our utilitarian planners would think about a social contract differently. So your approach is, in a way, devoid of or, or encompasses all of these details. Should I be thinking about your thoughts on this as a robust mechanism and approach, or min-max type of approach to informing policies um, in very, very big terms? Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so. Essentially, the robustness, if, if I take the uncertainty uh, approach versus risk approach, the robustness approach or the way we model it, the Gilboa Schmeidler type uh, uh, approach, is very much in uncertainty, it's more the robustness I was talking about. There's a certain range, and then you take the, the, the minimum of, of that. And we don't really know where this range is coming from, in, in a sense. And that's, that's a robustness approach, which I was talking about the oak and, and things like that. Um, and, and then the resilience thing is, is more about the dynamics of bouncing back. And that's uh, what I was emphasizing. So, but in general, I was, the whole approach I'm taking here is a little bit loose. I don't make a really a neat distinction whether people have a knowledge over the probability distribution or not, uh, whether they're more uncertainty averse or more risk averse. So this is a more high level, talking and doing it and, and don't really distinguish too carefully about whether that's uncertain version. And let me ask you, but then the success and the appropriateness of a social contract isn't usually very much dependent on all these fundamental primitive building blocks in our economic models. Yes, but here I focus very much the social contract should, which probably applies to both. I hope at least you tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, focusing on limiting externalities. Okay, so the, the, the main interpretation of my social contract is I want to, I cannot steal from you or have a social contract which make or do something harm to you. And, and especially these feedback externalities, that's what the social contract's main objective is. And that would, would apply. So the, about this insurance, whether it's uncertain and risk aversion, that it would make a bigger difference 
Um, but I focus more on, on the first part. Perhaps I should, when I go in the second part, I should distinguish. I, I didn't distinguish between the two in the book. I, I should look for that for that. Thank you. So, Marcus, let me <clears throat> ask a question. It's um, maybe more macro oriented, but you were asking about the license plate behind me. Yes. There's Milton's license plates and his California license plates he had on his BMW convertible. It's M it says MV equals PY. Milton used that to think about we should have a rule for money growth. And he argued it was good. And there's other, other rules out there for policy. Uh, there's also a fiscal rule, balanced budget rule, et cetera, which goes in deficit and recessions, et cetera. There's also the notion your tax system should be pretty stable. You're not, unless you have ways to have a react, regulatory system. That seems to me all in the direction that you're arguing for, a more resilient monetary, fiscal, tax policy, whatever. And is, it, is that really the bottom line? Because you don't emphasize that aspect so much, at least as I think about reading the book. It's, it's very valuable, the notion of resilience versus robustness, for example. But I worry that you're, very appealing um, emphasis on the general concept loses the focus on these really, really very practical things. Should the Fed have a role? Should the should the fiscal policy board, et cetera, et cetera. So do you have any thoughts about that, Marcus? Yeah, so I think I'm very much uh, in favor of rules and also of rules which, you know, give you some reaction functions. So it shouldn't be just a totally straight line rule where you can't react to things. So, and then there's of course the question, to what extent if there's a really once in a hundred years shock, how do you react to that? Then it probably can break away from the rules. So there is a, a fine balance with them. So you need flexibility. Part of the flexibility comes from the specification of the rule. And part of the flexibility comes that there's a common understanding, some cohesion in the society, as Stephen pointed out, that we can actually break away from the rule if there's really a dramatic shock we are facing. Uh, and that's that. this together, I would say, uh, would make them much easier to, to bounce back and have a resilient society. Any other uh, questions or thoughts um, from anybody? Got a, a, a lot of people on still, so. It sounds like we're out of questions. Marcus, do you have any concluding comments? Perhaps I can say just one figure I just wanted to show to sure, John. Sure, uh, sure. If you look at Japan, I think Japan is very you know, resilient. You see a case where there's no resilience. So what I've drawn here is the GDP of uh, Japan, and then it's just the trends going forward. You, you always have, a, whenever there's a financial crisis, you don't bounce back. You never get back to the old uh, growth path. But if you look at Fukushima, for example, which was an exogenous shock, you bounce back very quickly. So typically there's a, a phenomenon, if something is building up, if risk is building up and there's an endogenous imbalance and then there's a crisis erupting, you don't get back to the old path. But if it's an exogenous shock- um, uh, like Wait a minute there, Marcus. <laughs> what's exogenous, what's endogenous here? Nothing in anybody's long run growth theory says that you go from a 4% permanent growth down to a 1% permanent growth because somebody welched on some loans. Uh, so I, I, uh, the other story is that we saw that we're gonna stop ex extreme growth and, and then a whole bunch of debts went under and the GDP growth caused the financial crisis. But let's, uh, let's take that well, off. Fair enough, but I just want to show if there's an earthquake or things like that, typically, Yes. The bounce back is very much more. Much COVID. More. You're, you're looking COVID. at right now the big example. Uh, yeah, the so I, I, I went down to ever now, to so come back. Was, COVID back. was the world's biggest snowstorm, basically. Yes. So, okay, Marcus, but, actually, what, one person typed in a question who just had to leave. It's Michael Boskin. Let me just read it to you, if that's OK. Yes. yes. I have to hop on another call. Could someone please ask for me how moral hazard of policymakers Continuing knowledge, uncertain disagreement, at timing does he fit into this framework? I don't know if you can address that um, summary or not. Um, so perhaps I go into moral hazard from a different direction, not necessarily policymakers. So if you compare insurance with resilient support, I would argue resilient support has less moral hazard attached to it. So if I offer somebody who faces a negative shock and gets just some cash compensation, there's a lot of moral hazard attached to it. But if I give somebody 
uh, a way to bounce back by, by reskilling. Somebody becomes unemployment, and uh, I give them something to bounce back. There's much less moral hazard associated with that. Um, yeah, and I don't know. So in the in context of politics, uh, I don't don't have a real good answer at this stage. But I would argue that resilient support generally is less um, attached with moral hazard than simple cash insurance. Uh, John, very, very quickly, uh, Marcus, I uh, probably you, you've seen this book, but there is something that of, from what you've said that reminds me of Jared Diamond's latest book. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if it's in, you read it or you, but I, I discuss with Jared a lot because he does go into Chile and Japan and, yes, yes. and a number of cases um, and he compares in a very narrative way, but he has a, a analytical framework, um, um, resilient cases from non-resilient cases uh, when, it, when, when there is a huge shock. So um, you may want to take a look at that. Um, I forget the name of the, of the of the book, but it's a very very last uh, uh, Jared Diamond. It's not collapse; it's one after that. Okay, I will look it up. I, I have not. I know his old book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, and stuff. Yeah, like that. <laughs> but uh, I will may, look it up. Oh, sorry. Do you have, we have time for a few yeah, seconds? Comment. Sorry, Marcus. So let, then, let me ask you because we always hear. I should say always. We often hear that as economists, we're not useful enough. We, are, we make very detailed, detail, detailed dependent statements that depend on very many qualifiers. And so what is the prescriptions that we really offer that can be actionable within the policy arena? So should we be thinking about your book, Marcus, as trying to really distill uh, from the point of view of the production efficiency we're talking about within the variety of models, the many disagreements within the profession, academic profession, there are tenets that are common to our all findings that can inform uh, a fundamental thinking about what society should be based on in the face of crisis. Is that the way that you're thinking about the book? Yeah, I would say two things in terms of, perhaps it applies less to the US, but more to, to Europe. Uh, don't be afraid to go into risk and promote risk taking as long as it's resilient. So rather than risky or not ris risky, go for is it resilient or not. So shift the whole, sh go from a shift from risk focus to resilience focus. That would be the main message. And that has implications for many, many policy areas. I think that's, uh, I, would, I would summarize it perhaps in one little sentence. I'm a fellow European, so I hear you. Marcus, thank you so much. This is terrific. Yeah. It's such a broad concept and we're all thinking of ways to apply it. So. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank for being here. Thanks everybody for coming and for all your feedback. I appreciate it very much. Thanks.